Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another in AIFST series of technical webinars. Uh, today we have Andreas Kleber from Quality Associates presenting on food fraud and how TASIP and BASIP systems work to protect your business. For those who don't know me, my name is Giles Ailey and I am the Membership Services Manager here at AIFST. If you'd like to review anything discussed in this webinar, it is being recorded and will be made available to AIFST members and non-members who have registered early next week. I would like to introduce our presenter today, Andreas Kleber. Andreas has more than 25 years experience as a professional food scientist and technologist within the Australian food industry. He graduated from the University of New South Wales with a Bachelor and PhD in Food Science and Technology. Following two years of postdoctoral research with the, Australian, with the University of British Columbia and Agriculture Canada, he lectured and undertook further research for 13 years in horticulture and food technology with the Universities of Queensland and Adelaide. Andreas gained in-depth understanding of retail, technical and quality management through his three-year role with the innovation leading retailer Marks & Spencer in the UK. Returning to Australia, he worked as a technical manager and supply chain sustainability manager with Coles Supermarkets for seven years. In that time, he worked closely with a diverse food manufacturing base, including primary product and high-risk ready-to-eat products to enhance quality and protect brand reputation. Currently, Andreas is a partner and director in the Quality Associates Group, providing quality services and training to the food industry. Andreas is a professional member of AIFST and is also a non-executive director. Uh, throughout the presentation today, if you have any questions, you can type them via the chat function on your screen. Um, we will also be taking questions at the end, so just click the chat icon and type up any questions. Um, I'd now like to pass along to Andreas to begin the webinar. Thank you, Andreas. All right, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Giles. Uh, welcome, everybody, on behalf of Quality Associates. Uh, my name is Andreas Kleber, and as Giles said, uh, my current role is managing Quality Associates and, in particular, also training. Uh, our focus is really on pro uh, developing products for consumers with confidence so that manufacturers and retailers have products that meet customer expectations. Um, we work quite widely within the food industry, whether it's with retailers, uh, FMCG companies, meat, dairy, seafood, baking, and so on. Uh, but we also work with regulators, engineering firms, and packaging companies. So that gives us a pretty comprehensive view of what's going on out there in the food industry from a regulatory point of view, from customer requirements, uh, but also from uh, things that impact on uh, food fraud, for example, supply chain issues, uh, raw material sourcing, and so on. Just briefly, our services pretty much all uh, touch somewhere along the line on food fraud, whether it's consulting and setting up systems such as TASIP and BASIP, specification labeling, product testing, customer complaints, investigations, audits and inspections, and training and unfortunately also recalls that we manage on behalf of a major client as well. Um, that's what comes into play when everything goes wrong. Um, today though, I just wanted to talk to you about one specific aspect and that's food fraud. It's a $50 billion industry in the world. There are lots of different estimates um, of how much it's worth, but it's certainly not something that uh, can be easily ignored. So just to give you a couple of um, examples along the way of uh, how food fraud actually impacts on businesses in Australia and overseas. So this is an example about a Parmigiano uh, cheese. And in the US, they did a lot of work on detecting fake uh, uh, origins, but, but also finding that inferior milk had been used, that some of the cheeses contained sawdust, as a filler and so on. And it doesn't just uh, create a problem for the industry trying to sell a premium product, but obviously has risks for the consumer as well, whether it's from a quality uh, point of view or potentially also from a food safety point of view. Olive oil is one of the favorites um, along other products in the world. Uh, extra virgin olive oil is obviously a premium product and lots of people uh, try their hand at actually faking uh, 
either the origin or the quality of the olive oil and sometimes actually putting oils in there that have nothing to do with olive at all. Um, some of the statistics in the world are in Italy, for example, it's estimated that more olive oil is being produced than all the trees in Italy could possibly produce. And giving a little bit of a perspective, this is absolutely not a new issue. So the earliest olive oil inspectors are uh, recorded in the 24th century B BC, where they went along and made sure that people weren't faking uh, the oil in those days. Um, the ancient Romans had elaborate labeling and inspection processes in place to stop people siphoning off olive oil and substituting it, but also uh, putting different oils in there that it shouldn't be. And you can uh, get a perspective of how large that problem was for them. Uh, one of the storage facilities near Rome held 1.75 billion liters of olive oil. So even in those days, that was a massive problem that they had to deal with uh, food fraud. It's not a good news day when your scandal ends up on Wikipedia. So just looking back to 2008, the Chinese milk scandal, I'm sure you have uh, all heard about this and, and what happened in those days. And again, food fraud was the driver here, but what has really caused a major issue was that babies died in this case, people were very sick. And so food fraud has a massive health implication as well. If you were in the UK at the time, in 2005, Sudan Red was a recall that was probably the largest uh, recall in history. And the reason was that Sudan Red is carcinogenic uh, and through uh, being used for paprika uh, spice, it ended up in a whole range of different products. So the impact from one ingredient can be quite wide as far as the overall trade impact is concerned. Lately, we've had some detections in Australia, and it's not just foods, but it's also drink. And so fake scotch and tequila being sold in liquor stores in Australia. So uh, one of these is actually just fraudulently labeled. The other one was just uh, made up in a factory by mixing different ingredients and throwing a little bit of alcohol into that. Um, and actually, when the reporters went and asked questions, the workers there quite openly admitted that they just uh, mixed it up over there. And, and people are on the run trying to avoid the police over this. Um, in places like Bali, the problem is so widespread that there's a serious health risk to uh, consumers from uh, methanol being present in those spirits as well. So it is a huge problem. And it is a problem because it's quite easy for people to operate undetected when police forces have a lot of other issues to deal with uh, from drugs to human trafficking and so on. So what I thought in, in the framework of this is to talk a bit about what you can actually do about food fraud. And so there are the three key concepts that I want to talk about today. One is to look at the TASIB and MASIB system as one unified system, keeping a focus on where you really need to look, so where it is important to address it rather than uh, boiling the ocean and basically trying to deal with every single ingredient all in the same way and basically diluting your efforts. And then thinking how an attacker might actually go about uh, causing problems for you as well. So just to cover a couple of terms up front as well, so TASIP stands for Threat Analysis of Critical Control Points, BASIP Vulnerability Analysis of Critical Control Points. And sometimes it gets a little bit confusing because um, the word threat also implies and is used as that uh, it relates to somebody who could attack us and it also looks at how they could attack us as well. And vulnerability is more about where they could attack us so while the terms mean something on their own within threats and vulnerability analysis of critical control points, they mean something slightly different in that BASIP is generally applied to uh, food fraud and TASIP is a wider term uh, that actually covers other threats uh, such as food defense as well. So um, when we think about um, 
TASIP and VASIP, we don't see it as a standalone activity. These things are all integrated. The threats and the attacks that can come our way obviously are from different sources, but what they are attacking our food system, our businesses, uh, that is all, all the same thing. So we really need to start thinking as one unified system. And one way of looking at it is if you look at the quality house. So there we want to have specific business outcomes such as profit, customer trust, building our brands. And we can only achieve that with the right leadership, obviously, and some strategic planning. Um, so you need to have the right support from within your businesses to actually deal with food fraud, for example. But the pillars that hold up the house are things like HACCP, um, customer satisfaction and dealing with that, uh, training people, but trust, and that's where the anti-fraud measures come in, is really an integral part of the whole quality house. So it's not something that you can just operate in a standalone system. So to highlight that a little bit more, uh, basically when we talk about business continuity as the overarching uh, concept, we're looking at effects on the whole business. Things like strikes that delay uh, product coming in to our uh, harbors um, where we can have fires, electrical failures, and recently also ransomware attacks. So um, I'm sure you're aware of some of the issues we had last year with some of the global ransomware attacks where basically companies like Maersk, which is a big shipping company, couldn't unload their containers and therefore Food uh, ingredients were being held up at the wharfs, but also individual companies that couldn't operate and basically um, had to go on to maintenance and, and um, cleaning programs because they couldn't actually produce because their computer systems were locked up. So that's your overall business continuity and within that sits your food safety management systems. And traditionally we looked at food management systems as HACCP, uh, looking at facilities and equipment and our prerequisite program. So all those sort of things that come together uh, as legislated by FASANS, but also uh, as we know very well from all the food safety management systems that we run every day and that we're audited against as well. So within that now though, we have a new component and you know, the last few years, that's where we actually started looking at TASIP and BASIP but basically, that is part of the food safety management system as uh, we look at it uh, when we set up these programs. And uh, TASAP and MASAP really looks at two things, food fraud as well as food defense. So we won't talk about food defense today, but that's obviously different actors that could potentially target such as terrorists, uh, extortionists, and, and those sort of people as well. So we'll look at food fraud today. Uh, but just remember that for us, that's all the same system. Uh, and as far as overall management goes, that sits firmly within our overall food safety management system today. So just looking at the terms in a little bit more uh, detail as well. So BASIP focuses on raw materials generally. And that's if you talk to uh, companies such as Woolworths, they're very clear in their guidelines on those sort of things. But BASIP is really a subset of TASIP. And the subset in TASIP that BASIP relates to is economically motivated alteration. So basically, that's a term that's used for food fraud. So it's all about making money in some way in a fraudulent manner. Now, there are a number of different things that actually fall under the food fraud category. And they are substitution, concealment, mislabeling, dilution unapproved enhancements, counterfeiting, and theft slash spray market and diversion. And I'll give you a brief example for each one of those. So substitution, uh, you all would have heard about the horse meat scandal, so where we had basically a different meat substituted for what people thought they were getting, uh, and they thought they were getting beef. Concealment is hiding the country of origin or a region where the product was made and and, and doing that. Mislabeling is labeling a fish species as something else and, and selling it as something that's a higher value species. Dilution, uh, Manuka honey is quite well known for that. 
Um, and estimates say that more Manuka honey is sold in um, London than overall is available uh, from a production point of view. So we know that there are issues around that. And uh, lately, there have been a lot of programs focusing on honey in particular as well. And approved enhancements, we mentioned Sudan red and paprika and the issues that that caused. Counterfeiting, blending ethanol and flavors to come up with a drink that um, is being sold, as we saw through that ABC report. And then theft and gray market and diversions, uh, that pretty much speaks for itself. Uh, it's basically taking product and, and selling it and, and making money through stolen product or a product that shouldn't have entered in the market in the first place uh, through the route that's coming in there. Now, the other concept I just want to mention is Harp C. Now, that's not something that's widely discussed in Australia, but in the US, that's taking traction through the Food uh, Safety Modernization Act. And Harp C stands for Hazard Analysis and Risk Based Preventive Controls. So it's interesting that they've actually taken a approach that's similar to this overarching food safety systems, which basically is HACCP, TACCP, and MACCP, in that they're not just looking at naturally occurring hazards, but they're looking at radiation, natural toxins, pesticides, drug residues, decomposition, parasites, allergens, unapproved food or color additives, natural occurring hazards, and intentionally and unintentionally introduced hazards. So this is starting to muddy the waters a little bit between what is traditionally HACCP and seen as food safety hazards, which is basically your allergens, biological agents, chemical agents, or physical agents. So they're adding now some of the things that we start to be worried about as far as food fraud is concerned, as well as um, looking at um, food uh, security as well. So radiation would be something that could be used in a terrorist attack, for example. But looking at unapproved food and color additives, that's certainly in the realm of uh, food fraud itself. And it's also talking about unintentionally introduced hazards. In our case, we don't call them hazards, but food safety risks. Um, but in the US, they're really starting to uh, work on pulling all those systems together under one hat itself. So what we can learn from that is really going back to the previous slides of treating all this as one system. Now, and the other thing that we've already talked about is really that all of these food fraud issues do and can lead to food safety risks and people getting uh, poisoned. So I'll give you one more example, and that's the cumin scandal. Um, and the question is, was that accidental or was it fraudulent? And so that's an issue that got a lot of traction in the US. And that is where people uh, contaminated or cut cumin uh, powder with peanut shell. That happened overseas. That product got imported into the US. And it ended up with 700 products being recalled from 40 companies. Now, it's very easy to imagine what could go wrong with peanut allergies as far as this ending up in, in the food industry and that um, people being exposed to this when they have a peanut allergy and it's not labeled. So it's a very, very serious issue and it's not an isolated case. So I had a quick look at how many recalls we had on cumin in Australia and I couldn't find a single one. So that raises a question and the question is are we looking hard enough and learning enough from international incidents and that is particularly the case when we have such an interconnected uh, supply chain and i would find it hard to imagine that we would not get similar cumin and into australia that they are imported into the us so it's just something that we need to be aware of and we need to scan uh, what's happening out there and actually then start asking ourselves the question, uh, why do we feel safe in this regard when we know there's an international scandal and we should really go and have a look at our own uh, supply chains and also potentially do some testing to just verify that we are not exposed to the same issue. Uh, another little issue boiling along at the moment um, in, in the European Union is meat detection uh, in vegan and vegetarian dishes. 
Uh, that's very topical at the moment, and people are starting to talk about that of the scandal of the day. Um, the interesting thing is that it's only trace contamination. So obviously meat is expensive. Putting that into vegan dishes would have not really a uh, financial benefit. And so I would see it more as being accidental um, in the sense that it's uh, present, not by design. Um, but I also would say it comes back to insufficient cleaning and segregation and those sort of issues in the manufacturing environment. And at the end of the day, this wouldn't be a food safety issue, but it certainly would be quite brand damaging. So keep it focused. So as I mentioned at the outset, is we really want to only deal with the serious risks. We can't deal with everything at the same time. So when we're looking at keeping things focused, we want to look at three different levels of risks. One is to the business, so that you could see as a head office or a brand that's being managed, a specific site, so that's a factory and issues that could happen within that environment itself, or something that is targeted as far as your product is concerned. So, and the business and site specific uh, fraud level, you might imagine that somebody uh, such as a senior management manager, a procurement manager, those sort of people potentially could uh, be involved in systematically defrauding either a business or because they actually have targets that they can't meet. For example, there are lots of financial pressures in the industry and finding something that's just that little bit cheaper and, and helping. Uh, meet financial targets could be an incentive to people uh, to actually engage in these sort of um, practices. So often corporate functions are actually separated because of that. So the purchasing person isn't going to be the same person that manages product development and specifications. The quality management is separate to that and somebody will sit at the factory door and check that things come from approved suppliers. So there are ways and means of actually keeping those sort of issues in check. So it's important to separate your functions in that space. Product specific fraud can arise uh, throughout the supply chain. So we talked about cumin, uh, we talked about melamine being added at factory level. Um, honey, we've mentioned, you could imagine that things like palm oil and then claims such as sustainable production could be uh, challenging uh, in this day and age, just from a management of um, supply chains is concerned. As far as those supply chains are concerned, they're quite complex, and that's where we recommend that actually you categorize uh, ingredients that you're purchasing or foods as much as possible, and that you then start looking at individual high risk raw materials. So if, if a modern manufacturer with hundreds of ingredients was to do a risk assessment on each one of those ingredients, you end up with a risk assessment that would go over hundreds of pages. It would just be way too complex. And at the end, you spend a lot of time and you forget about the real critical factors in there. So what we re would recommend is that you group ingredients into different classes. You select the highest risk ingredients, for example, something imported from a high risk country. And you could also look at, at that as a representative case as far as you developing your programs. So I would just like to give you one example of how that can be managed. And so this is just part of an example of food supply chain that we've grouped by packaging, batters, their ingredients, general ingredients, fish, meat, fresh produce and so on. And so just looking in a little bit more detail, if we pick out general ingredients, what we've done here is we've looked at the key stock steps. So things like importing, uh, sourcing of a raw material, transporting, mixing and blending and so on. So rather than in a HACCP uh, program where you look at each individual process steps and all the inputs and outputs, we're looking at a higher level uh, to be able to identify where the potential risks actually sit. So is it at the source of the raw materials? Is it during manufacturing and, and mixing and packing? Is it on site? Uh, so they're the sort of uh, issues that you can then start analyzing by looking 
specifically at those steps and for specific ingredients. Now, you might end up with a ingredient and let's say honey, if that was going to be used that we know is a very high risk ingredient just because there's so much fraud going on in that space. You might want to split that out and keep it separate from the general ingredients. But I think you're sort of getting the understanding of that grouping things as much as you can is going to be helpful of doing a sensible uh, risk assessment. So now that we know where the risk sits and how we can actually assess that, uh, looking at history of contamination, where it could come from uh, as far as fruit fraud is concerned, um, we then also need to think of how an attacker might actually uh, attack our food supply chain. So we need to monitor and evaluate and anticipate what's actually going to go on uh, in this space. So thinking like an attacker, there are really four key questions. Who might want to attack us? How might they do it? Where are we vulnerable and how can we stop them? So who might want to attack us? We talked a little bit about that of, of a, you know, basically a manager, supply chain manager, uh, a company within that supply chain potentially attacking either out of misplaced uh, ideas of supporting the business or actually wanting to make money out of it themselves. And quite often uh, beyond those internal experts and opportunists within your business, you actually have criminals that actually can operate in syndicates as well. And so uh, things like the mafia in India, work, uh, in, in Italy, sorry, working in uh, the space of olive oil is probably quite well known. We then think, what are the methods? So we've talked about substitution and dilution. So horse meat coming into the supply chain, that is one of the ways in, in which uh, that supply chain was actually attacked. Now, we know that as the case, and therefore nowadays retailers, manufacturers, they're all checking for different kind of meat substitution. But we need to be uh, remaining vigilant to make sure that new trends that are occurring are actually addressed within our supply chain as well. When we looked at the, um, the overall uh, flow chart uh, just before, that's where you start identifying where we're actually vulnerable. So is it during shipping or is it at uh, specific steps where people can actually get access to material or substitute or feed something else into it? And then when it comes down to actually preventing it, there, there are lots of different things that are available already, but also a lot of new developments. So basic systems would be things like security cameras, having proper fencing and so on. Um, and fencing is quite often a problem when I go on site and have a look at factories. Quite often it's actually a problem from the neighboring site where people can actually climb over fences quite easily at times. But it's also use of temper evidence seals on containers, on, on uh, packaged goods and so on. There's a lot of new uh, technology being developed at the moment, and that includes barcodes that can be specific for each individual item rather than just a product. So each wine bottle, for example, could have its own unique code, and you can then trace that back throughout the supply chain, and it can flag if the same barcode had been used in a sales transaction previously. There are destructive labels. There's also data loggers that are sensitive to shock and light. And the way that can be used is that when it's placed inside a container, uh, you can actually see in real time whether the container is being opened. And these data loggers can ship around the world. So you can see in real life uh, the, uh, time where the container is and whether it's deviating from its route. So they're the sort of systems that are being developed at the moment. There are also the detection methodologies and IBM is working on what they call a crypto anchor verifier, which is basically something that can be attached to a uh, mobile phone and that can actually start looking at unique uh, characters that a product might have and distinguishing it from fraudulent uh, products as well. The other thing that is more and more widely used is forensic accounting. And that might sound very complex, but it's even simple things like keeping an eye on global market prices. 
And if you see anomalies such as prices going up because there's a shortage of supply and somebody comes with something that's significantly cheaper than what's available on the market at the moment, you might have some alarm bells ringing and thinking, well, are we going to be exposed to fraud at this stage? So how uh, does that actually match up with the current market trends? So there are easy ways to do that. And a lot of retailers, a lot of manufacturers will be on top of pricing, especially of high uh, value ingredients. So things like uh, Madagascar vanilla beans, for example, you would want to know how much that costs at the moment and whether you're likely to be defrauded. And fraud is much higher in categories that actually have a high value. Just make more money out of that. So if we want to think like an attacker, we really need to think of uh, how could we actually defraud our business? What would be the best way? And thinking about that, you then already start seeing what some of those issues potentially could be because most of you working in a business, you would understand it as best um, as anybody else could and therefore have the insights to be able to anticipate and deal with this. From an attacker point of view, there are really three things that uh, allow them to basically get away uh, or actually implement a successful attack. And you need to think about their motivation, their determination, and their capability. So motivation, the way I look at it is it's something that would get you off a couch. So you're just sitting down, you're thinking about something that you would like to do. And the motivation in this is actually it gets you going, you get off the couch. And in this case, for food fraud, it's making lots of money in a uh, fairly low risk way. So that's where determination comes in. So once you're off the couch, are you actually going to go out and actually start doing something? So it's not just the initial getting going, but actually now determination to go through with it. And in food fraud, sadly, there's a very low risk of detection, as I said. So it's important uh, to think from that point of view and see, can you actually uh, uh, prevent somebody uh, accessing your supply chain and can you detect them? And from a capability point of view, can they actually uh, carry out that attack? And the problem with food is that often they're cheap, low-grade materials that are available so people can actually easily uh, carry out the fraud attack. So it's important to start thinking that these three things have to come together. And if you can disrupt one of them through either detection or taking away their capability because you're using seals on the containers, those sort of things are all things you can implement as far as controls are concerned. And so you have, as I've mentioned, those internal controls, stopping access, testing of raw materials, supervision, cameras within the production areas. The old things that you can control. As far as external controls are concerned, there's working with your supply chains, so working with your uh, raw material uh, suppliers, for example, testing by industry bodies. And an example of that would be where the whiskey industry in Scotland is actually carrying out global testing to find fraudulent product because they know that if there's a lot of fraud, they're high value. Uh, product is going to be undercut and loses credibility and therefore the whole industry is at risk. And it also comes back to regulators and police actions and those sort of things and Opsen, Operation Opsen which is being carried out by uh, European police forces and that Australia participates in actually does carry out some of this uh, activity as far as enforcement is concerned and they do publish material on uh, what they actually find. So thinking like an attacker, we need to monitor, evaluate, and anticipate. And so monitoring, for example, is horizon scanning, looking what's actually out there. On the right-hand side, that uh, schematic actually shows some of the things that were found over the last year. So bean curd that was basically colored with methyl yellow. Fraudulent practices in the seafood industry um, in Italy. And I've just pulled up a report for May 2018, which is the monthly summary of food fraud and adulteration. And that, that sort of information is priceless because it tells us what sort of issues are out there. Going back to our old friend, the olive oil in Brazil, 
60% of olive oil sampled basically was fraudulent. That was 300,000 liters of olive oil. Pasta being filled with the cheese that it was, in, that, that it was substituted and it wasn't actually the cheese on the label. We've had more olive oil problems in, in Spain. We had uh, wine being falsely labeled in uh, Italy and they substituted low price wine and the company on the label didn't even exist. So they're all sort of um, warning signs there as well. We had Cummin as well and the Spice Board of India confiscated 23% of uh, Cummin Spice because it was contaminated. So you know, they, the information is out there and we just need to make sure that we keep looking for those sort of issues. So evaluation really means just making sure that our systems are actually functioning. Uh, so reviewing our systems, making sure that the TASIP and BASIP programs that we're building are actually fit for purpose. And a lot of companies we talk to uh, start up with a fairly simple system, but they soon learn that it's actually a little bit more involved. And so they then progress and review it. And, the interesting thing too is that auditors are becoming a lot more aware of what's actually required in those systems. Whereas last year they went around and saw fairly simple things, by now they're actually learning from experience what some of the better systems actually look like. And so it's important from a due diligence point of view and being able to pass your audits that you keep developing your systems and, and stay up to date with that as well. And then anticipation is really about the ability to respond. And the ability to respond in some cases will require a recall. And that's where obviously you go into food safety issues. So it's important that you're ready for recalls, you do mock recalls, and mock recalls aren't just about traceability, it's actually can we access people after hours? Who are the regulators we need to talk to? How can we get some more testing done? What do we need to do as far as advertising is concerned? So all those systems have to be tested. And you need to start thinking if, if those sort of trends are an issue in common, for example, what are you going to do as far as amending test protocols is concerned? Are you going to start looking for these sort of issues? So there's quite a bit of work on, uh, on your systems required and staying up to date and doing all the due diligence to keep your consumers safe and your business protected from fraud. So in summary, really today we talked about dealing with TASIP and MASIP as one system under food safety uh, management systems, staying focused on the key issues and thinking like an attacker and being able to deal uh, with new arising issues, being able to find ways of preventing them attacking. Um, so that's basically my presentation for now. And um, what I would like to see is whether you have some questions to Giles, but we also do have an expert blog where we talk about some of those issues if you want to uh, subscribe to that. And obviously we're doing training courses in this field and other areas as well if you were interested to find out a little bit more. Um, but with that, I would really like to hand back to Giles and thanks for your time. Fantastic, thanks Andreas. Um, just at the moment, if you go to your screen, you'll see a little chat icon there. If you click that and type up any questions you may have, um, Andreas will be more than happy to answer them. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in though, I think I have one. Um, as a con from a consumer perspective, how can a consumer uh, be aware of food fraud? So what are the warning signs um, as a consumer for food fraud? Well, one of the things is if the deal looks too good, you know, maybe it isn't really a good deal after all. So, you know, be aware of where you're sourcing things from. Uh, if you're on holidays, for example, and, and people are selling you grog for, you know, a quarter of what it should cost, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, in Australia, just be aware um, if the label looks a bit funny, um, you know, if that's not a high quality print, those sort of things are all giveaways. Uh, brands spend a lot of time on maintaining their quality and their trust that consumers have in that. 
Uh, so think about also what sits behind those sort of systems and manufacturers and retailers do spend a lot of time and effort in making sure uh, people are actually safe. Um, and then start looking for anti-fraud devices, um, think about tamper evident packaging, they're the sort of things that can give you some confidence. And as I said, in the future, um, at the moment, people tend to trust what's on the label, but in the future, you'll be able to actually scan labels and it will be able to uh, provide information that shows whether it's a real article or not. Um, so all that technology will keep evolving at a rapid rate, I would say. Fantastic, thank you. So we've had a question in. Do packaging suppliers need to complete a vulnerability assessment form? I think anybody within the supply chain potentially uh, has a risk of food fraud occurring. And in the case of packaging, well, you want to make sure that you're actually printing on behalf of the authorized company, so the brand owner of it. You're not just printing it up for somebody else that's going to use it for food fraud, for example. So making sure that the packaging that you're shipping doesn't go lost and somebody else can intercept it. So that can be important as well. So having uh, proper seals on, on transport, making sure that people deliver product to the right locations. And then from a reuse of packaging, it becomes a problem for some of the brand owners because we know that baby food tins over in China are being repurposed after they're empty and being filled again. So having ways of actually uh, making sure that the packaging gets defaced in some way or destroyed in some way uh, while you open it and so it can't be reused is another important uh, function as far as packaging manufacturing is concerned. Okay. So we don't have any more questions. Uh, might just wait a minute or two to see if there are any more questions come in. All right. So it's very quiet waiting for people to type up questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, while we're running, one more question. Um, what's the most common form of testing done um, on products? Is it normally an X-ray scan or is it actual product sampling? Well, it depends really on what concerns you have. So if you're dealing with meat, for example, you might do some DNA testing to make sure that you don't have other species present that um, you wouldn't expect. So, you know, pork, for example, going into beef or horse meat and so on. So you can test for those sort of things. Some of the ingredients houses do a lot of testing on imported and, and locally produced ingredients and they look at purity, but also you can look at measures in olive oil that uh, look at oxidation and therefore whether something is actually extra virgin olive oil or not. So it depends really on the product and what you want to go testing for. And it comes back to your risk assessment as well. You may not want to test everything yourself, but you may want to have certificates of analysis from your um, importers, for example. And it comes back to also how much do you trust that certificate? Is it being supplied by a trustworthy company or somebody really obscure overseas has done some tests and basically it could be a fake as well. So it, it depends on uh, your relationship with, with your suppliers and your supply chain and your understanding of that as well. But 
you may not have to test everything yourself, but it helps getting some information from other people as well. But at the end of the day, you're responsible for your product and you need to understand how you manage your risk in the best possible way. Okay, thanks. That's, we've had another question come through. Can you share some good examples of horizon scanning measures being applied by small companies? Yeah, so I've uh, had a couple of examples. So the early warning system in, in Europe uh, is quite useful in that it highlights food safety issues during importing. Um, Operation Opsin, if you Google that, it has very useful information and it has also um, information regarding findings in Australia specifically as well, since our police forces are participating in that as well. So there are some examples of where you can log on once a month and have a look and, and see just what some of those scandals are. And then our press is writing about a lot of these things as well. Um, you know, if you go back to uh, before the milk scandal in, in China with the melamine, nobody ever thought that this would be an issue. But as soon as it became obvious uh, that this is a problem, everybody is now testing and making sure that their supply chains aren't vulnerable and being attacked in that way. So there, there are a lot of easy ways in, in which you can actually uh, get information on that. So it's the media, but it's also specific organizations that work in that space, and the Europeans are quite good at that. Keeping in mind that often the supply chains that we share uh, around the world are quite similar to what the Europeans might use. Looks like there aren't any more questions. Um, however, if anyone does think up any questions over the next few days, um, by all means send them through to AIFST and I'm sure we can forward those along to Andreas for answering. Um, Andreas, was there anything else you'd like to add? No, just thank you very much for your time and great talking to you. And thanks for uh, AFSD organising this seminar. Not a problem. Thank you, Andreas, for presenting. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, as I said, this webinar will be available up on the AIFST website, hopefully by the start of next week. Um, so once again, thank you, Andreas, and thank you, everyone, for joining us.